environment is so crucial to affordable housing, to our health and well-being, to the way that we live in harmony with the planet. And so that's why I'm so excited about Design Council's role in bringing together all of these different design disciplines, because we can't design in silos. Hello everyone and welcome to Future X, a podcast by Martin Hearn, Event Director, Future Build, and co-host Dr. Oliver Jones, Research Director, Rider Architecture. Future X will bring together some of the brightest minds and some of the most disruptive thinkers and innovators to transform the construction industry and build a Future X community of like-minded people that can begin to make a real change. We really hope you enjoy the series. Hello and welcome to Future X. Um, this is our third episode. And Oliver, we've had a bit of a change to the agenda this week. We certainly have. I'm off to Dundee next week, Martin. I'm going to the Dundee v and and nice. the Design Council are hosting an amazing session, uh, a festival called Design for Planet Festival. And I just thought this is a fantastic opportunity, while COP's on and the Design for Planet Festival's on in Dundee, to get Kat Drew in as a guest who's the Chief Design Officer at the Design Council, and talk to us a bit more about what they're hoping to achieve with the Design for Planet Festival and some of the amazing innovators and disruptors that they're going to bring together during those two days on the 9th and 10th of November next week. And you're going to be joined by around about 100 influential people working right across the sustainable design industry. It's going to be good. You're going to have a lot of workshops and outcomes from that as well. Yeah, it's a real it's a real privilege to be asked to go down um, and work with the guys that they're bringing together. I think the the breadth of the connections and the network that the Design Council bring in terms of all of those design disciplines in one space, yeah. trying to address our biggest challenges. You know, we talk a lot here on Future X about bringing the wider communities and the in the arts and the sciences together, but this is really interesting because this is bringing together the wider design community into one space. In fact, it's bringing together the wider global design community into one space as well at one point during the two days, uh, which hasn't been done for about 40 years. Yeah, I was going to say the amount of synergies at this event to what we try and do with Future X, you know, driving that cross sector collaboration, giving a platform to not just the pioneers, but also the disruptors and the innovators. It's, it's a really good event and um, it'll be great to hear from you you know, when you come back as well. Looking forward to it, Mon. Well, I'll tell you what, let's dive in and hear what Kat's got to say. Hi, Kat. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I guess the first place to start really is what is the Design for Planet Festival and who's going to be there? Design for Planet Festival is a landmark event and the first big event of our new campaign, our new mission, Design for Planet, which is to galvanise the 1.69 million strong UK design community to design with the welfare of the planet at the centre of everything they do. Um, and so we're expecting people from across the design economy, which includes people working in planning, the built environment, architecture, interior design, and also fashion, graphic design, UX design, service design. Uh, we need everyone working together to design for Planet. So we're expecting to have about 100 people, including yourself, there are in person in Dundee at the beautiful b and Dundee. And we're also expecting about 6,000 people to be joining us online for free to listen to all of the amazing speakers and also take part in some really quite practical workshops. And I guess it's part of the Future X goal is to build that community as well. And it's a fantastic thing to see that you bring in together such a diverse community of thinkers and designers and people into, into one space. Um, one of my questions was, is this just the built environment? But you've actually answered that in that it's totally multi-sectoral in the way that, that you're presenting this. Can you tell us a bit more about some of the people that are going to be joining us from those different sectors? And, and then maybe we'll have a conversation about how just how important you think that, that multi-sector cross-collaboration is. Sure. Well, I might start there, actually, because, you know, for, for us at Design Council, we think that 
you know, design shapes the world in all of its senses, the clothes that we wear, the places that surround us, the services that we use. And so design in all of its different forms has this huge power uh, to design for planet, but also and also a huge responsibility to do so. And actually, like last week, we were just we had a conversation with our design council experts who are a small community within the 1.69 million about inclusive mobility. And if you think about a topic like inclusive mobility, it shows how much you need all of these different uh, parts of design. So you need the design. Andrew Cameron started us off with this amazing um, talk about you need to start off with planning and infrastructure to allow inclusive mobility but then you also need really good service design because actually mobility as a service means it needs to be accessible and inclusive for lots of people you need amazing graphic design and wayfinding you need fashion design to be able to come up with fabrics that people can wear when they're doing active travel so when they get to work they're not sweaty if they don't have a shower you need all of these different bits of design amazing ux and digital design um, designs of landscaping and parks and that's just one subject. So multiply that, that by all of the different things that we need to think about when we're tackling the climate crisis. And you can see a role for all sorts of design. So I think, you know, it is definitely for the built environment professionals, not just because there are talks from people, amazing people within the built environment. For example, Anthony Dewar from Network Rail, um, Simon Jones, who's at the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. We've got Michael Paulin, um, his, um, who's been a pioneer of biomimicry. But actually, the built environment professionals need to work with other designers. They need to work with uh, service designers, with policy designers, with graphic designers. Um, so actually, they'll also be able to learn from um, people like Naresh Ramchandani, who uh, creates amazing visual communication campaigns, do the green thing. Uh, Jonathan Wise from the comms lab and thinking about advertising and marketing, who set the kind of cultural surround sound, as Jonathan says, for all the decisions we make about sustainability. They'll be able to uh, learn from the policy lab, who are at the heart of the UK which are people and planet centered, which again sets the kind of framework through which a lot of um, built environment professionals do their work. They'll be able to learn from um, Snook, who do a lot around UX design, because actually you need to design really great digital interfaces to make sure that people can move around their places in the right way and to do that in an accessible way. So Andy, Andy um, Hyde from Upstream Scott will be doing a workshop on inclusive design on, on the Wednesday. Brilliant. I think it, it's really it's really testament. I mean, Martin and I have often spoken in the past around the need for design, and particularly the design of our environments, to draw on the wider arts and sciences um, outside of our sector and, and learn learn the lessons and best practice from those sectors. But it's it's such a crucial role to be playing on the design front just to galvanize those different thinkers within the design sector itself, as as you've said, you know, that's I think it's going to be a really exciting event and, and the outcomes are going to be really interesting. A lot of the comments in the, on the agenda and the things that you've, you spoke about already deal with this idea around regenerative design. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's something I just wanted to touch on for a minute in, in, in terms of your views on regenerative design and, and how important it is. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's just, it's just critical. And, you know, if we can design things that can grow isn't that the most beautiful and powerful thing we can do? So two talks to highlight there, I suppose. Um, well, we've got a whole track on designing with nature. Uh, so we've got Natsai Audrey Chesa, who will be talking about um, how she works with um, organisms to create amazing textiles, uh, which can kind of grow and, and emerge. Uh, Julia Watson, who wrote Low Tech, um, radical indigenism um, and she goes back to all of these different communities from around the world who have been building their environments in harmony with nature um, for millennia which we can learn learn from um, and we've also got Josie Warden from the RSA who's just released um, a really really good easy to understand paper called regenerative futures which talks again about how design can not just sustain but actually regenerate and we've got the paul hogarth 
a company doing a workshop on green and blue infrastructure and landscape design, which obviously is part of increasing biodiversity um, within the places that we live. So there's a huge amount there on regenerative design. That's thinking about kind of, I suppose, nature, but also, I mean, my background is, is social design. And the, the maxim that we always use in social design is start with what's strong, not with what's wrong and always looking at the kind of the assets that are already there and existing in communities um, or the materials that already exist. I've just been on a talk around fashion design and actually how we just start with materials that already exist um, and reuse those rather than creating anything new. I think just I could see Martin's desperate to jump in there with a question but just 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 before he does uh, on, on the topic of that we usually ask the the people who come and speak on the on the show to tell us a bit about their background as well and you know it's as much about people as it is about ideas and i'd love to hear a bit more about the journey that you've been on in terms of design and, and how you've ended up where you are today sure well um i suppose i started off nowhere near design <laughs> so um my background um initially coming out of uh university uh where i'll start my story um was in history and French and I went straight into into politics so into the civil service and my route into design was really um through getting frustrated at writing all of these speeches for prime ministers and lots of different strategies for secretaries of state um and they were all about empowering people but these were people that I'd never met and lots of people around me hadn't met and that seemed slightly ridiculous to me um my route to design was to try and get out to communities to understand people's lived experiences so that i could write better policy and co-design it with them um and i was using graphic design as a way to break down some of these very complicated policy documents to to share that information in a way that was accessible so more people could be involved in a decision making process um, so I was a co-founder of the Policy Lab in the UK government, which brings design, that type of design, into the heart of how we make policy. Um, and then I joined a service design agency. And then because I know that service design alone won't help us um, tackle these big challenges like homelessness or health and well-being, I joined Design Council because at Design Council, we also cover the built environment. And the built environment is so crucial to affordable housing, to our health and well-being to the way that we live in harmony with the planet and so that's why i'm so excited about design council's role in bringing together all of these different design disciplines because we can't design in silos and there's amazing so not only can we not design in silos but there's amazing practice happening over in the advertising um, industry there's amazing practice happening over in fashion there's amazing practice happening with bio design in the built environment and we have to design for climate with urgency but also with care so this is not jumping straight into doing which means people often go down into their silos but actually taking time to learn from each other across a community so that we can go further faster together for me, Future X, and what we try and do with this podcast is to really showcase those pioneers, but also the disruptors and the future generations as, as well. And what I would say about your agenda is, is that there are so many good, engaging, disruptive talks happening, and especially from the future generations as well. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. So we start with um, Anita Akunde, who's not a designer. Um, she's an amazing climate activist. 17 year old from Manchester so she'll be kind of setting us off um, on a on a track to say why this is why this is so important for future generations um, and then we've got some amazing uh, kind of designers uh, who will be talking about their practice so we've got people like Finn Harries who is a, a filmmaker um, from Earthrise Studio and he uses film design and communication design to um, raise awareness about the climate crisis, but also he's done a beautiful series of um, uh, very, very short films about architecture um, in places like Hong Kong. So he's amazing. Then we've got um, Alayla Ajaralu, um, who's the, a UN champion of the earth and her whole design practice is around disruptive design. Mm. So she'll be um, 
doing a keynote, but also a workshop on day two. We've got people like Josie Warden from the RSA, uh, Mina Hussman, who I mentioned, um, and then we've got our own Bernard Hayes, who's one of our design council team, who will be sharing some of our work that we've been doing on measuring how to measure the environmental and social impact of design. And it's, and it's extremely timely. We've got a COP going on at the moment. There's a big, you know, it feels like there's a big transition within the industry to, you know, it's, it's we've done the talking, it's now to action. And that, what I love about your agenda is it's great to see not just talks, but a series of workshops and an unconference as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the outcomes you want, you want to see from this? Yeah, sure. So it's so exciting to have so much stuff going on. We're hoping that it feels a bit like a TV studio, everyone, everyone playing their part. So on day two, so day one is all about big, inspiring talks, showing what's possible. Um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned we've got Indy Johar and Kate Rawest starting us, setting us off with um, some really big picture thinking. And then on day two, it's about ideas to action. So for the people who are going to be there, the hundred um, people that we've um, kind of invited personally, they will be doing an unconference. And an unconference, who knows what they want to bring to the table. Everyone will have their own intervention. And we as Design Council are just holding the space for that. Um, but we want to champion whatever comes out of it. But a couple of things that we will be doing there will be a policy roundtable hosted by the policy lab and that will be where we want to um, kind of bring together and develop some policies that help designers to design for planet we will also um, be doing an international roundtable where we'll be convening all of the other design councils around the world i think this is certainly the first time in 30 40 years anyone's done this to say what we're doing as a global community uh, to design for planet there's 1.69 million uh, design community in the UK, but there's 60 million worldwide. That's an awful lot of people making decisions about what we put into the world. Um, and we're also creating a series of principles, uh, design for planet principles. And we are working to see how we do that both in person and online. We will develop them out of the ones that we've started in our systemic design framework. And we really want to build on these. Um, and then the other thing that we'll be doing uh, on um, is uh, sharing for the first time our Design for Planet film. And what we hope by all of these things is that designers who want to design for planet will have a few more tools, techniques, um, things up their sleeve to share with clients when they start projects. Because that's the thing we hear. Lots of designers want to design for planet, but it's not in the brief. So we hope by sharing this film designers can play it to their clients at the start of a meeting and the message is put planet into the brief and it's got the design council red logo to give them permission to do that um, we've got a series of principles designed for planet principles which will be great as a starting point for a kickoff meeting to say which ones of these are important and then we'll have all of the workshop resources from the workshops so that people will leave with a set of tools and resources that they're able to use. Fantastic. Oliver, I'm going to put you on the spot here because you've been uh, recognised as one of the 100 most influential people working within the field of sustainable design by the Design Council. You're attending. What are you hoping to get out of the two days? Oh, well, I would have appreciated a bit of a heads up here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really, really excited that the Design Council have brought together so many people into the same space. I think there's going to... You know, there's, there's a clearly an energy across the design sector. Um, and actually, one of the biggest challenges was how do you how do you capture that energy? How do you get it into one space? And then how do you make it work? And the idea that we'll be able to contribute to these workshops, that we'll be able to work together and talk about the development of these design principles that will underpin the sort of the future direction and recommendations, I think is is a really powerful one. And, and the vision of the Design Council to bring all of these different uh, design disciplines together, I think, is, is one that really should be celebrated because we've always said, let's look to those wider arts and sciences, as, as, as we've discussed. But just getting a handle on the sheer diversity that we've got as a design sector it, 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 in its own is, is commendable. So, th so what I'd like to get out of it, Martin, is just one, to be part of a, of a great festival of design. Um, to meet 
loads of like-minded thinkers and disruptors and innovators, but to really help to shape that set of design principles and contribute to those workshops so that we can really make this Design for Planet movement last. Yeah, well, I'll be watching online. And, and I think I was looking at the agenda um, and what I would say is the, the person with the best job title accolade definitely goes to the UN champion of the earth that you have on there. Can you tell us a little bit about Layla? Cat. Yeah, I mean, Layla is a force of nature. She is amazing. Um, uh, she was one of the first people that I met uh, after lockdown lifted and we were able to meet in person. So Layla, um, Layla's practice is really around disruptive and systemic and circular design, those three words. Uh, she's got a great methodology and she's an awesome presenter. So she'll be doing a keynote to end us on the um, Tuesday and then she'll do a Kind of long workshop actually I think it's kind of three hours talking you through some of those methods and we've spoken a lot because I've written quite a lot on systemic design and, and for both of us this is like this is not making the current system a faster smoother better uh, version of itself in a way taking away you know some of the critique I suppose of, is making things t so easy to be consumed has actually um, caused some of the, the challenges that we've got so this is about disrupting and actually reframing everything that we do, uh, redesigning everything we do for that kind of alternative, um, more sustainable, regenerative uh, future that we all are hoping for um, and to do that in a really positive way. So, um, so yeah, so I'm really, really looking forward to, to her talks in particular. We've, we've heard a lot about some of the amazing people that you're going to have at the event, Kat. Um, it would be really good just to have a bit of a run through from your opinion of some of those track sessions that are going on, not necessarily in, in, in who's talking, although that'd be good to know, but the, the content and your thoughts around why it's important, why each of those tracks are important. Yeah, sure. So let me, um, I mean, this has all come from, obviously there's, there's COP going on, the government's got its 10 points green recovery plan uh, we know what the priorities there are we know which sectors are you know create the most are the most polluting there's fashion there's construction there's waste all of these things and we've also as design council been doing some research uh, with various different stakeholders again across the whole design economy so some of the tracks speak to that so for example sustainable and resilient places so thinking about how we uh, work um, around the built environment and natural environment to create places that are um, kind of low carbon, so they mitigate against kind of um, emissions, but also res um, resilient and adaptable, knowing that, you know, temperatures are rising. We are um, also thinking very much about kind of circularity and how we not just reuse materials or use more sustainable and natural materials, reuse them, but also regenerate them. So we've got a whole track around um, circular design uh, with um, Simon Widmer from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation chairing that, but also designing with nature. So we've got um, Martin Dave Robertson from the Hub for Biodesign and the Built Environment chairing that, and amazing speakers that I've mentioned before. Um, and then we've also got one which I love called Starting a Behavioural Revolution. And this is also for design to not just think about how we use materials really sustainably, but how we produce things that shift our collective behaviours. So we've got also the De Castro who started up an amazing campaign, global campaign called Fashion Revolution. She'll be talking John Thackerer, who's just an amazing uh, speaker, so knowledgeable about kind of regenerative design. He's got a proposition of ecology hour for all designers to um, to take up. He'll be prototyping that on the Wednesday. Um, and also Naresh Ramchandani, who, as I say, he uh, started Do the Green Thing in 2007, which is a whole load of amazing graphic design and visual communication uh, artworks to promote us to um, to create to work in more behavioural ways. He even uh, commissioned my husband's uh, to do his first piece straight out of uni. So I've got a soft spot for Naresh. <laughs> <laughs> I think the um, 
it was interesting what you say there because a lot of us are very focused on some of the solutions but i think that one of the big things that you've touched upon there is how do we start to change behaviors and and that obviously comes through in in, in as you've said your social design background and and interests and maybe you could just expand on that the sort of the need for us to really start to address behavioral change and behavioral evolution in order to accelerate us towards a net zero future we've got we kind of know what to do we've got a lot of the innovation the technology the science um you know a lot of that a lot of that is there um and if you think about the conversations that ha are happening at, at cop it is this quite kind of technological um solution first conversation and i think the two things that we're saying at design council it, it needs to be a social revolution we need all of that we, we know the tech but to actually embed it and get people to use it you need to design it with people so we always talk about design for planet but actually it's design for planet with people um and then the second thing is that again we we focus a lot on carbon emissions but we also doesn't need to design with nature design regeneratively because there's also a biodiversity crisis as well um and the kind of the final point on that is we've got a track which is so important called design for a just transition and this is because um you know we know that the west uh, the richest one percent uh, produce 50 percent of carbon emissions and actually people who don't produce that are bearing the brunt of the impact of the climate crisis and so we've got a whole track so it's chaired by ian mckinnon from the global innovation disability hub we've got araceli camargo uh, from centric lab who's a, a, a neuroscientist working in in the built environment um, we've got jason tester who is from queer the future and we've got joycelyn longdon from climate in color and so they will all be giving really important perspectives about how we have to design inclusively and then, as I say, we've got a workshop with Snook and Upstream the next day, all around inclusive design, um, because the design for behaviour change, you have to understand people and their motivations and their opportunities and their capabilities so very well. We spoke to Maria Smith recently of Euro Happel, the sustainability lead there, and really set a few thoughts in motion around we're, we're very focused, as you said, on carbon emissions, we're very focused on um, embodied carbon, but brought to the table the ideas around social embodied value um, or embodied social value to um, to the designs and the, the proposals that we're doing. And I, and I really like the notion of, of, of capturing that embodied social value in, mm -hmm. in our proposals. Well, I think that leads to another kind of track talk, I can, uh, which is around design with community. And uh, I suppose this is kind of where I started uh, before I even knew it was designed when I was trying to work in with communities around it was around um, antisocial behavior actually but one of the things there is there's been a lot of you know design for communities um, but actually the better thing is to design with communities and build design skills within communities themselves so we've got Immy Core from Civic, um, from Civic Square in Birmingham who is just amazing um, and uh, they're um, Urban Splash have created Port Loop, um, but part of Port Loop is not just the design of a hundred kind of low carbon houses, but it's all about low carbon living. They've got a set of 10 island rules, um, which are also all of these ways in which the community needs to plant whatever doesn't move. Um, Immy's um, set up um, the front room, Civic Square, which is a community space. You've got the yard, which is by the Maya group, which brings artists together. And it's all of these different ways where actually you're understanding the assets which are within communities, social assets, and using those as the materials of your design. So there's a, there's a phrase that uh, we use a lot in social design. It's actually from asset-based community development called start with what's strong, not with what's wrong. And it's a lovely phrase, and I think you can apply it to both social and material um, assets. But yeah, let's not create anything new until we've really grown what's already there. I think that's a, a, a brilliant sentiment, Kat. I suppose to, to sort of round off, this idea of the design principles, tell us a bit more how you think these design principles could be used, will be used, the, the value of them coming out of this session. 
Yeah, so I think they can be used in a number of different ways. We were toying for ages between, is it a manifesto, you know, going back to uh, First Things First manifesto um, and Ken Garland from the 1960s, which had been renewed a couple more times. Do we start off with something like that or do we set up start off with a set of principles which are kind of maybe a softer language? But ultimately, we've gone for principles because we want these to be something that designers can talk to with their clients in a non-confrontational way um, at the start of the project because in our systemic design framework what we're saying is before you even get into the design or even understanding the problem starting off with a shared sense of values that you can work on together and building those relationships is so important and we so often rush over it in our kind of um, our need to, to start designing things so um, the, the, the ones that we've got already in the systemic design framework are people and planet centered, inclusive and welcoming difference, zooming in and zooming out, seeing the bigger picture, collaborating and con connecting, testing and growing ideas and being circular and regenerative. So we think that's a pretty good starting point, but we, uh, we always, I really wish I'd put a massive alpha stamp on the on the front of that systemic design framework because i really wanted to co-design it with more people so this festival provides us that opportunity to do that and we'll see where it we'll see where it ends up i imagine something about question the brief will will find its way in there but we'll see and how do people get involved i suppose is my my last question really so two things that i would love um this community to do is first of all go and register um, www.designforplanet.org you can see the agenda there you can register and it will take you straight to the festival site um, and block out your diaries for the 9th and 10th next week uh, the second thing and there's three things the second thing is to share it with your friends and your networks and I'm so uh, grateful for you both to invite me onto this platform um, to share it with your community because actually there's lots of communities we need to connect together so that's the second thing. And the third thing is that also on the website is a survey for designers and architects and urban planners to take. Um, and this is so we can start to measure what skills, what design for planet skills we have in the UK. Because at the moment, uh, we think there are a small number of people who are absolutely expert in this and have been pioneering it forever. There are a large number of designers and people working in the built environment who really, really want to, but can't because they don't know how to or they um, um, the permission to by their clients. And then there's a probably smaller group who don't really care about it. Um, anyway, we're focused on that middle large group, but we want to make the case to government that there needs to be more funding for skills um, for that group. And so we would love your help in creating some data so we can make that case. So please, um, when you're going on the website, also take the survey, it will take you two minutes. Brilliant. I think how we normally wrap up these is that the tagline to Future X is the future yet to be determined. What's the future you want to see? The future I want to see is where design, all of design's talent, power, resources, creativity, is being used to design for planet and to be doing so in a really inclusive way. Brilliant. Thank That's you. That's excellent, Kat. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was great talking to Kat and it was really good to see an event with so many tangible outcomes as well. It wasn't just a conference. There seems this real shift in the industry at the moment, but that it's about galvanizing and bringing people together to actually work on outcomes as well. And there's a real action, sense of action as well, especially with COP going on um, at, the, at the moment. Um, Oliver, we've got a whole array of future guests coming up, which really sort of emphasise these points. Can you tell us a little bit about who we've got next? Yeah, absolutely, Martin. So we'll be speaking to Manish Datta, who's director at the UK Green Building Council, in our next episode. And the chat with Manish is just absolutely fantastic. You know, we hear a bit about his background. We go into some of his amazing achievements um, as a net zero pioneer in business operations with Marks and Spencer. And then talk to him at length about his current 
goals and projects and the things that he's working on at the UK Green Building Council. So it's definitely one to uh, to to make sure that people tune into and listen to. Mm. And a, a big theme for us here at Future X is about collaboration as well. And so if you're listening to this and you want to get involved, please reach out to us. Also, if you like it, share it. But most importantly, subscribe as well. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye. Join our community to stay up to date with all things FutureX. Visit futurebuild.co.uk to sign up. Please also like them and share them to help grow our community. You can subscribe to the podcasts within your favourite podcast platform. Thanks so much for listening and we hope you'll be back again soon.